Sharing a meal is simple. Everyone needs to eat. It's a daily necessity for each of us. It's a built-in opportunity to share time with others. Sharing a meal is sacred. Food is deeply embedded in our personal identities and practices. Recipes are passed down generation to generation. I imagine you can think of some right now in your own families. Food is prepared by hand. It takes time. It is a gift of our own making. It's vulnerable when we make a recipe for others. It allows us to take risks. At its very core, food is a survival need, so sharing food on a primal level is one of the most powerful acts of care imaginable. Sharing a meal is inclusive. Since early times, gathering, preparing, and sharing a meal together is the pillar of community building. Sharing a meal is not isolated to any one culture. Because humans are social animals, our instinct is to gather together and to find strength in numbers. Therefore, the act of sharing a meal is a common thread that extends through all of us. Sharing a meal consistently, and I use that word deliberately, sharing a meal consistently deepens relationships and builds community. Conversations have the space and time to go beneath the surface. The common thread of food helps us to find other common threads between ourselves. And that consistency, there's that word again, that consistency of a shared meal means that you can work through life's ups and downs together. There's power in that. You feel seen, you feel heard, and you are stronger as a result. Sharing a meal gives us pause. In a life where we are living on our phones and where we schedule our days to the max, sharing a meal gives us pause. It gives us a time to breathe, a time to stop. And that, paired with the relationships and trust built around the table, does wonders for our physical and our mental health. Sharing a meal extends to every culture around the world. Many of you will be breaking your, um, your Ramadan fasts with iftar dinners. People gather for holidays and for birthdays, but shared meals do not need to only center around special occasions. They do not need to be formal or fancy. They don't have to be planned weeks or days in advance. They can be spontaneous and informal. Many of you will be heading to college or university in the near future. Who does that apply to here? Yeah, there's lots of hands that just went up. And when you go to university or college, you're going to be starting a new chapter. It may be the first time that you're living away from the routines and structure of home. You get the opportunity to build your own routines, your own structure. And I wonder, will sharing a meal be a part of that? In 2021, the University of British Columbia did a study of students who chose to eat together, who chose to share a meal with others. They had some interesting findings. They found four things. The first thing was they found that students tended to have healthier eating habits, and that makes sense. You're not just grabbing a bag of chips on your way out of class and calling it dinner. You have to be more deliberate about your choices of what you're gonna put on that table if you're sharing a meal. The second finding makes sense. Those students who shared a meal were more socially connected. It goes back to that idea of feeling seen and feeling heard and being able to do life's ups and downs together. They were building community. The third finding was a little surprising, that these students who took themselves away from their studies for that space and time every day to share a meal actually did better academically. That that time away from the books showed up for, with better academic performance in the classroom. And then finally, people who shared a meal, these students who took that time, had lower risk of substance abuse. And so I wonder, those of you who just raised your hand and you're starting to think about these new routines and structures you're going to build into your own life, are you going to seek out people to share a meal with, other people to build community? Some of you in the audience, <laughs> me included, are not headed out to university or college anytime soon, but we may be looking for ways to deepen our relationships and build community, especially in the last two years of living under the mandate of social distancing. We may be craving that and seeking ways to rebuild it. 
In her book, Eating Together, Alice Julier argues that dining together can actually radically shift people's perspectives. She states that it reduces people's perceptions of inequality, and diners tend to view those of different races, genders, and socioeconomic backward backgrounds as more equal than they would in other social scenarios. I go back to the idea of food being that initial common thread. It's something we all share. And over the table, then we get to seek other common threads that we may not notice immediately. There's power in that. Many of us spend much of our, our weeks with colleagues. We're at work. And those of you who aren't working yet, you will be eventually. And you, over the course of the week, you share time with others. But Cornell University, a prominent university in the United States, wanted to know what actually builds trust among colleagues. And so in 2015, just before the pandemic, they wanted to dig deeper into that. And they looked at firehouses in the United States. Let me paint a picture for you. Firehouses um, are buildings and firefighters will go and live there for multiple days at a time so that they're together and they're always at the ready to go and fight the fires when emergencies come up. Cornell assumed that it was the intensity of their work that built that trust among the colleagues that these people were placed in life-threatening situations and therefore had to depend and trust each other. But in the course of their study, they found that it wasn't, in fact, the intensity. Any ideas of what built that trust? Food, exactly. It was food. They prepared and ate meals together. The nature of living at the firehouse led to them sharing meals naturally as part of their day. And Cornell found that that time that they spent together, where they sat across from each other and found those common threads, where they were seeking to know more about what was going on in each other's lives, they were no longer just colleagues. They became friends. They were human to each other. They knew what made the other people vulnerable and what they wanted out of life. And because of that, trust was built. I wonder, in our own workplaces, could we peel ourselves away from our work for 20 minutes? Could we find colleagues to eat with? Could we build trust, increase morale and efficacy? And how would that transform our workplace as a whole, the simple power of a shared meal? Intuitively, this makes sense. We agree. But what is the reality? What is actually happening? University of Oxford in 2017 wanted to know what was actually happening with meal times, And so they partnered with the Eden Project and they did a study of meal times in the UK. 76% of those questioned believed that sharing a meal was a good thing and would strengthen community. And I'm guessing if I asked right now, we'd probably be at about the same percentage. Yeah, sharing a meal's great idea. However, the reality that they found through their study was that one third of weekday dinners were being eaten alone. The average adult was eating 10 out of 21 meals a week alone. 69% had never shared a meal with neighbors. And 37% had never eaten as a community group. Do you see yourself in any of these statistics? I find them to be a little staggering and slightly disheartening. As we emerge from two years of social isolation due to COVID, we realize just how important and priceless relationships are. So now what? How can we rebuild community and deepen relationships? And I take us back to the table and to a shared meal. Years ago, my husband and I lived in Kenya. And one of the things we loved so much about living in Kenya was the priority placed on relationships there. I knew if I needed to go next door to borrow a cup of sugar that it wasn't going to be a short trip. My husband would actually say, okay, I'll see you in an hour. Because he knew when I went and knocked on their door, they'd invite me in for a cup of chai and for a chapati. And that we'd sit and we'd share time together. We'd catch up on our days. We would see each other. We would hear each other. And so when we moved back to the United States, that's something we wanted to take with us, that priority of relationships which is sometimes hard to do when you step into a culture where that isn't the priority. And so the first couple of years, we managed to maintain community and build relationships in our neighborhood and in the broader community outside our neighborhood. And then life started to get busy. 
and our neighborhood started to feel like that video at the beginning where people would come home and they would walk into their homes and they'd close the door and we wouldn't see each other. There was no connection. We didn't talk with our neighbors as much. We didn't know what was going on in their lives and I missed it. I missed these people. I missed that feeling of community. And so I, I started to think, well, what could we do? How could we rebuild it? And I went back to the idea of a shared table and of eating together. Everybody needs to eat, even in our busy lives. And so I was that crazy neighbor, and I went door to door. And I knocked on our neighbor's door, and I invited them over. I said, come to our home for dinner on Wednesday night, 6 to 7.15. I know you're busy, so let's make it short. 6 to 7.15, bring whatever you're making for your own family. We'll make a meal of it. Nothing formal, nothing fancy, just come. So Wednesday rolled around, got home from work, quickly cleared off all the counters, set up some folding tables, prepared the food that I was going to make for our own family, and I waited. I was a little nervous. Would people show up? Would people be craving community as much as I was? Six o'clock rolled around, and they came. The door opened, and they came, and they brought the food they were preparing for their own family. We put it on the counters, and we made a meal of it. And we got to talk. We got to find out what was going on in each other's lives just for that hour. And I think they enjoyed it because they came back again the next week and the week after that. And pretty soon we had a name for it. We called it community dinner. And each week when I put the, the reminder on our neighborhood group chat, I said, come community dinner Wednesday night, 6 to 7.15. Bring whatever you're making for your own family. There's always room at the table. And I really emphasize that part. There's always room at the table. I wanted everybody to feel welcome. Everybody should step to that table and feel seen and feel heard. They kept coming. For four years, every Wednesday night, we had community dinner. For four years, every Wednesday, somebody was in our home. It was never just our family from 6 to 7.15. And we got to share our life's ups and downs. This is a picture from years ago. You can, you'll recognize um, my kids who you know, Jake and Becca, they're much younger there. But for four years, from 6 to 7.15, we had a crew in our house. And we got to share life's ups and downs. We got to mourn deaths and job losses. We got to celebrate birthdays and job promotions. But even more importantly, we got to do life together. We got to talk about what was going on. We knew when somebody had a meeting they were nervous about, and we could say, hey, how did that go? Somebody was excited about something, and we could circle back and say, tell us about it. Share the joy with us. And one thing that was really cool was when somebody needed to ask advice. The life perspectives that sat around the table and the life experiences were amazing. And the advice that was shared was always fascinating. Four years of this. There was something special going on with this community. People, we had one family who moved in and was renting a house for just a short time as they looked for other homes. They ended up buying that house because they were so plugged into community dinner and they loved that sense of connection. Other neighbors said that Wednesday nights were their favorite nights of the week because they could see, be seen and heard. They felt connection. Our last community dinner was March 11th, 2020. Does anybody know why? COVID, yes. March 13th, two days later, the world turned upside down and we were no, no longer able to have people in our home. And then that summer, we moved here to Tanzania and still under the wraps of COVID and you know, advice to not gather in large groups. Now we're starting to emerge. And I still miss community dinner. I miss that Wednesday time. And I take us back to these statistics that I shared earlier. How can we change these statistics in our own pockets of community? How can we harness the power of a shared meal in our daily lives? How can we always have room at the table at lunch at school and not just inviting somebody to join us, but to really see them and hear them? How can we find a way to share a meal in our workplace and how can that transform what it feels like at work? How can we throw our doors open in our homes and invite people in for a meal? How can we share a meal with our teams, with our school groups, with our faith communities? How can we build in simple ways to share a meal and with each meal shared, how can we build a stronger and deeper community? Thank you.